Hello, World Connections. This is Ali and Hassan. I'm joined today by Dr. Song Wu Kang, postdoc fellow at Harvard School of Medicine, postdoctoral endodontic program. Song, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you for having me, Dr. Nassi. Uh, we're doing the next installment of the um, endodontic management of the medically compromised patient, and today's topic is coagulation problems, and more specifically, how do we deal with patients who are, are uh, on anticoagulants or they have coagulation uh, problems in endodontic therapy for surgical and non-surgical uses. So let's uh, talk about coagulation. Why don't you just uh, kind of briefly uh, talk about what is coagulation, uh, do a little uh, review for our, uh, for our viewers. Sure, so coagulation basically, simply speaking, is uh, uh, cleft formation, or more professionally speaking, uh, it's a thrombogenesis. So basically the oversimplified sequence, as you can see on the slide, is uh, once a vessel injury occurs either through uh, external or uh, internal, trauma, the platelets uh, start adhering to the exposed collagen by von Willenbrand factors, uh, or VWF. And then once they adhere to the exposed collagen surfaces, they start aggregating. And this aggregation process is aided by thromboxane A2, or TXA2, or ADP. And then once they aggregate, aggregate they, uh, act they get activated. And then once they get activated, the uh, platelet plug is formed and then is further stabilized by uh, fibrin from fibrinogen through the coagulation cascade. That's, uh, that's true. That basically sums it up as a big uh, picture view. And we are all familiar back in school in the pathology and uh, hematology courses, mm -hmm. learning about the extrinsic and the intrinsic pathways of coagulation. Can you just very briefly tell us what we need to know on the, uh, as a reminder? Sure. So um, this picture, it's, uh, nobody's expecting you to memorize or anything like that. But the important take home message from this picture is that there are three pathways involved with a coagulation cascade. Uh, so basically, there is an extrinsic pathway, and then there is intrinsic pathway. And then there is a final common pathway where the extrinsic and intrinsic uh, converge onto uh, uh, and combine together to become one. And basically, uh, the important thing is you have to know what factors are associated with which pathway. So for, for example, factor 7 is associated with the extrinsic pathway, factor um, 12, 10, 9 uh, mainly with the intrinsic, and then you can see from the picture that factor 10 is the starting point of the final common pathway. Yeah, I think the overall idea to, to remember is that we have a bunch of proteins and enzymes mm. in the plasma. Sure. These things get activated right. through the extrinsic or intrinsic pathway, which are either direct injury that exposes uh, the collagen mm. in the, you know, beyond the endothelial uh, sloughing uh, off, uh, and then also by contact with any of these uh, different uh, um, just by contact, you will end up having either the intrinsic and the extrinsic pathways activated that ultimately leads to fibrinogenesis and the formation of fibrin mm -hmm. plug. Some of the laboratory tests that we do obviously are a reflection of these pathways and how they um, um, the, how they function, whether they're normal or abnormal. Can you just kind of very briefly go over some of these? Sure. So, uh, so some of the main, there are a lot of laboratory tests, and we get confused a lot which one's more uh, important than the other. So basically, uh, some of the main tests that you should know uh, as an endodontist is, uh, first of all, INR, International Normalized Ratio. Uh, it's basically tests uh, extrinsic and common pathway, and then uh, APTT, uh, which is an uh, abbreviation for activated part or thromboplastin time. Uh, it tests intrinsic pathway mm -hmm. and uh, along with a bleeding time uh, which basically you uh, induce bleeding with a small needle uh, pricking and then mm -hmm. um, basically see how fast uh, bleeding stops. It's one of the crude tests but it's very important as we are going to talk about more in the case later. And then lastly there's a thrombitine and then the normal values that we should expect for each test is uh, written on the slide yeah. as you can see. That's true, and I think, you know, when I was a resident uh, many, many years ago, the thing that we were always looking at were the values of PT and PTT, mm -hmm. uh, which is basically, you know, through your extrinsic and intrinsic pathways. But now, the international normalized ratio, which is a ratio of the PT of the patient mm -hmm. over a normalized uh, uh, group of population, mm -hmm. gives us a ratio that is more of an indication of the patient's uh, uh, bleeding habits. You know, obviously, you know, anywhere from 0.8 to 1.3 or 4, I think, mm -hmm. is, is the normal range. Right. Uh, what are some of the other ranges that we need to, to be aware of in, in 
you know, as endodontists. Sure. So uh, again, as you can see on the slides, uh, there are three breakdowns uh, regarding the INR values. So if uh, the patient is taking either Coumadin or Warfarin, most likely the patient is uh, going through some kind of coagulation uh, complication. Uh, so basically, uh, most patients uh, that are on this medication will know their INR values. So if when the, you you need to ask. Uh, them about their INR values first. So if they say their INR values are between two and three, then uh, they're really, the, the dosage does not need to be altered uh, before um, any procedure. But if INR value is uh, somewhere between 2.5 and then 3.5, then maybe you should start considering uh, dosage alteration, but it's not absolute um, necessity that it's that needs to be done but if the INR if the patient says INR value is over 3.5 then that's the uh, time when you should start consider uh, delaying invasive procedures until um, dosage is further decreased and in order to do that obviously you need to contact physician to discuss the reduction of the patient's dosage of those two medications and uh, this will usually take about five three to five days and then uh, once the target INR value has been confirmed by the physician, you need to schedule the patient within two days for the procedure. Yeah, yeah, that is true. So, um, what else should we should we know? Um, when in doubt, refer. Uh, there's there's no point in trying to figure out and then trying to Google it on the spot uh, what to do. Uh, basically, patients with a, uh, any kind of possible or significant risk or history of a bleeding disorder should be referred to a hematologist uh, for a lab test. Um, you can order it if you feel confident about the coagulation test, but I think uh, you know for medical legal purpose uh, these days, it's, it's best, it's, to, get, it's best to get them referred. Exactly. Yeah, obviously, having the laboratory value is really critical, mm -hmm. and uh, I'm you know, doing a thorough history and inquiring about patients that have, you know, histories of bruising and other kinds of um, um, conditions that would indicate potential um, problems with mm. coagulation is also very significant. Song, you have a case for us. Why don't you sure. uh, just uh, go over the case that... Uh, sure. So, uh, the, we have a patient named MD. Uh, she's a 46-year-old Hispanic female patient. Uh, she came with a cheek complaint of, I have pain in my upper tooth and my dentist tells me I need a root canal. The patient actually uh, pointed to number 13, which was part of a bridge. Uh, when I asked about the past medical history, she actually talked about, she didn't mention anything about, oh, I have a coagulation problem, I'm taking warfarin or coumadin, but she said, I have frequent nose bleeding, I don't know why I bleed a lot when I brush, um, and then bruising after, she gets bruised really easily after minor trauma. And the patient had a mi very, very minor plastic surgery a few years back, and then uh, during that minor surgery, uh, it resulted in significant bleeding uh, f uh, for a while. So that was kind of like a red alert to me. Yeah. So I started, um, I referred her for some of the lab tests, tried to contact her physician. Um, so regarding the tooth itself, as you can see, the tooth was, although it was part of the bridge, there was a, a root surface exposed, so I was able to do actually thermal test. And uh, it was cold negative, percussion positive, uh, palpation negative, probing death was normal, um, there wasn't any uh, significant radiograph, periapical radiolucency. So the diagnosis was uh, pulp necrosis with uh, symptomatic apical periodontitis. Uh, basically, the, uh, there were two canals, uh, buccal was 21.5, palatal was 20.5, uh, and it was instrumented, uh, and then you can see the pre-op and post-op. Uh, yeah. That's a beautiful case, uh, doing you. access through um, a bridge, especially with a cantilever on a premolar mm -hmm. that is almost like a pure abutment. It's very difficult to get proper orientation. It looks like you managed this very nicely, found both canals and treated it completely to the apex, so that, that's great. So what else did you find out about the bleeding? So system? basically what happened with this patient was, uh, although the case seemed pretty straightforward, uh, when I actually went into the um, area and then put, placed a rubber dam uh, more like towards the gingival the area, gingival column, yeah. there was a lot of bleeding. And, um, and this was after I contacted the physician, got the PT and all these uh, INR values, they, which were actually completely within normal range. So I actually spent about an hour after the case trying to achieve hemostasis just from the gingiva. In, um, and I started wondering to myself, what did I miss? All the values are normal. Um, and then I realized that uh, there was, uh, on the paper that uh, the assistant brought, um, there was a bleeding type 
bleeding time uh, written on the back page, which was never, uh, which basically we missed. And then the bleeding time, the, as you probably saw from the previous slide, the normal value should be between one to six minutes. The bleeding time was 15 minutes. So why is this important? Um, Basically, the patient had a uh, von Willenbrand's disease, uh, and bleeding time is a great indicator for that. Um, basically, um, as you can see on the slide, I'm not going to go into detail, but there are several types associated with it. It's basically inherited disorder of platelet adhesion. So basically, platelets never actually adhere to the exposed collagen surface, which actually compromise the overall uh, the vessel uh, coagulation process from the very beginning. Yeah, you don't form the, the original adhesion is kind of compromised because the von Willem exactly. factor is missing. Right. So but basically they get washed off. Mm -hmm. They don't stick. Then you don't end up getting the proper fibrinogen in the cascade, creating the fibrinogen plug. Mm -hmm. So uh, that is that is great. And what about postoperatively for patients that have von Willem Brand's disease? What is what do we need to know? So obviously uh, for post-op instructions, you need to make sure that uh, patients don't take aspirin or NSAIDs, um, any kind of uh, agents that can act as uh, blood thinners. Uh, uh, you need to make sure the patients don't take it for a while. And then, um, but acid aminophen can be used instead um, in reduced dosage. And then also it can be combined with codeine as well. Uh, and then you need to obviously provide an emergency contact number uh, and then need to educate the patient that if bleeding doesn't stop within 48 hours, uh, then the patient needs to contact you. Uh, and then you need to discuss whether you should refer the case at this point or not. Yeah, that is true. I mean, von Willenbrand's disease is not all that common, but every now and then you do run into these patients, and sometimes they're completely undiagnosed. Right. Um, it's amazing how many of cases of even hemophilia and so on that the patients are unaware of themselves. Right. Right. And many times, especially in women, they end up finding out about this postpartum right mm -hmm. after giving birth. Mm -hmm. uh, they end up having all these uh, problems. But if you look back into the history, you see these issues of bleeding uh, gums and uh, you know acumosis and and uh, you know. Um, bloody nose and so on and so forth. So it's very, that's a very good um, overall summing up of the, the whole issue. But coagulation, let's talk about surgical versus non-surgical usage. Mm -hmm. Obviously, uh, or, or applications in endodontics. In non-surgical applications, I think that patients that have, unless you're really h above three and a half mm -hmm. uh, in terms of your, uh, you know, I and R, mm -hmm. that you really don't change the, uh, the the way we treat these patients. Right. Because right. clearly there's not a whole lot of bleeding associated exactly. with endodontic therapy, especially non-surgical endo. Mm -hmm. And these patients are basically kept the same. The real question really comes down to surgical uh, management and specifically mm -hmm. apicoectomy, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. There was an interesting article, and I actually interviewed Dr. Wall, who wrote the article on stop the anti uh, the the, uh, the anticoagulation. And in his article that he did, he basically did a kind of a, a risk benefit analysis to find out is it worth it mm -hmm. for us to stop the anticoagulation for patients that um, um, you know, that, that are on anticoagulation in order to do surgery. And when he looked at, took a look at the review of the literature, he found that the risk of having any of these potential supervascular accidents or uh, throwing a thrombus uh, or a heart attack uh, kind of outweighed the potential risk for bleeding postoperatively. So we did have a discussion on that uh, uh, little interview because you know, it's true that during apicoectomy procedures, I'm not worried about my patients uh, dying of excessive bleeding if they're having, you know, if they're on um, anticoagulation therapy. But to do the procedure, you need to have good visualization, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, it, it goes back to really studying and, and making a uh, professional judgment about the, um, you know, the risk of, of a problem. Uh, versus doing an apicoectomy. I mean, should you then remove the tooth versus doing an apicoectomy in those cases? Um, but, you know, obviously removal of the tooth itself requires surgical extraction too. So I think there's a lot of questions to keep in mind. The whole, um, nowadays, as patients are living longer and longer, mm -hmm. and anticoagulation therapy is more and more common, I think this is something that all young practitioners, as well as people that have been in practice long, are going to come in contact with very frequently. I mean, it's on a regular basis that I see patients that, you know, in their 60s and so on that are on anticoagulation therapy because of a recent, you know, history of MI or a cerebrovascular accident or something that has uh, uh, prompted their physician to put them on anticoagulation. And, um, you know, it's understanding the risk. According to Dr. Wall, it's not worth the risk to right. stop the anticoagulation. But 
I think uh, it should be judged on a case-by-case -case basis and the reason. Of course, I think we know that three to three and a half and above surgery is really has to be uh, questioned and anything um, below that, it's um, possible to do the surgery, but mm -hmm. you know, make the patient aware of the need for post-operative uh, measures to c control the bleeding to the extent possible. Well, Sang, I think this, this was uh, helpful, hopefully. If any other questions come up, you can ask us in the um, uh, Ask the Faculty Questions portion uh, or uh, down in the comments below. Well, I was joined today by Dr. Sang Wu Kang, a postdoctoral endo fellow at Harvard School of Dental Medicine. Sang, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you for having me, Dr. Nassim. And um, for Real World Endo, I'm Ali Nassim, and we hope you found this information helpful.